Like there's like three days where there are temperatures the exact same way. <laughs> All right, he's starting to record, so I'm gonna go off video now. Okay, so we're, uh, we're two minutes in, so I think we'll get started. And uh, as usual, so I'll just give a, the very basic, most simple overview here of what's going on. And then Tim can do an introduction of, of himself and his own work before he begins. But um, we have Tim Coombs here today, as everyone here should know. And Tim is another Purdue grad. So, you know, gay Purdue. And he's in Texas. So he's in like the, the heart of the, of the uh, virus contagion. So he's hiding in his study there. So um, today, as we know, he's going to be talking to us about crisis. As a reminder, uh, if you hit the space bar, it'll temporarily, temporarily unmute your microphone. So if you want to make a comment or say something, that's often the easiest way. You don't have to go searching for the unmute button. And then when you let go, but it turns it back on again. And then, uh, you know, please participate to the extent that uh, Tim asked you to, and I'm going to set it up for participants so he can put his slides up. And then um, I'll let Tim take over and he can do a, an introduction of himself and uh, tell you what he's going to do today. All right, so let's see if. All right, so can you see the slides, everyone? Yep. Okay, great. All right, uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk some about crisis, and I want to talk about some of the more interesting aspects of crisis, and that's when we run into kind of really extreme or difficult crises, and what do we do then? Because, you know, what we know about crisis communication works pretty well most of the time, but what about those times when it may not work so well? I'm going to talk about that. And I'll, I'll start by just giving kind of a little bit of context of what I'm meaning here about crisis. And then from there, kind of move to the nature of crisis, then get to the sort of the, the main idea of, of moral outrage and kind of end up with a discussion of, a little bit about the Volkswagen case that's there. And along the way, I'm going to pose some questions and feel free to answer those questions because they're not rhetorical questions. You can actually give some answers to those. But uh, one of the things I kind of want to start start out with is that you know we always talk about defining terms, and I had a lot of professors in graduate school at Purdue who were really big into definitions, and part of that was so that we actually knew that we were talking about the same thing, <laughs> because we often use a term, but does that mean we really are talking about the same thing or not? And that happens a lot in crisis because people will be talking about crisis and then they, they start talking like, wow, that doesn't seem like anything like what I'm talking about with crisis. And that's because people could be talking about natural disasters. They could be talking more about the health side, which is what we're now in with COVID-19, which does impact organizations. But what I want to focus on here really is, you know, about how I'm using the term. And I'm focusing on what I call for lack of a better term right now, real crises. So I'm not talking about like a social media crisis. I'm not talking about a reputational crisis. Because, you know, over the years, various conferences and settings, we've talked about this. And a lot of us in crisis think that, you know, neither of these are really good terms for capturing a crisis. And I'll get into a little bit more about that in just a minute. But you know, like, well, you call it a social media crisis. What really is that? You know, when someone says something bad about you online, then you see someone saying, oh, we're in a crisis. Like, well, no, someone just said something bad about you. And reputational crises, yeah, sometimes those can be serious, sometimes not as much. But they're not really real crises. They're not where crisis communication came from and where crisis management came from. Those came out of and I'm talking about an organizational setting here, those came out of really a fear over disruption of your practices. And so what I'm doing here is I'm kind of differentiating between a crisis and when you have operational crises and paracrises. And that's where I lump what a lot of people call reputational crises or they call social media crises. Think back that, you know, it was born in Australia when Subway was confronted with the fact that their foot long subways weren't a foot long <laughs> like is that really a crisis i mean how many people measure it plus it starts in australia and don't you all use the metric system yeah so so why would why would someone even bother 
in Australia to measure as deep as a foot long. And then, then there were lawsuits about it, which went nowhere. But, you know, was that really a crisis? And I, I remember when I first started doing the research, I met some practitioners. And that was one of their points is like, wow, you folks are like way too willing to call something a crisis. In an organization, we wait, you know, and this means something special, that this is really something threatening that either has disrupted or has really the potential to disrupt our operations. And so what I put up here is this kind of difference between operational crisis and para crisis. And uh, para crisis was just kind of a term to kind of categorize what we were seeing out there you know, in, in about, you know, early 2010s, is that you were seeing organizations need to manage crises in public, uh, or really their crisis risks. Because it used to be if you had a risk and you managed it internally, and I remember telling students, a lot of your work, no one's ever going to know about, because you found a risk, you avoided, and there was no crisis. So as Heath likes to say, a crisis is a risk manifest. So if you can identify the risk and prevent it from spreading, no crisis, like that's great. And no one's gonna know you did it. Well, that's not the case now. <laughs> Nowadays, a lot of people know you did it. Of course, there are still a lot of risks that in occur internally because organizations are not that transparent and they don't let you know what might've happened because you don't go on social media, hey, our facility almost blew up today. Yeah, that's not what you do. But a lot of your risks do get drawn out in public and it's often driven by stakeholders who are pushing it saying, hey, we don't like, in most cases, how you're doing business in some way. Or they might raise the fact that there's a problem with your product that, we, that you might need to look at. And that might be a precursor to letting you know you have product harm. So in contrast to that, the operational crises, they, they really can threaten your operations. They might shut you down. And that's at the heart of crisis management because when you don't operate, you don't make money. And we've seen a lot of that during the pandemic. You don't operate, you don't make money. In the United States, they've just restarted our National Basketball Association. And they were, why are they doing that and have this very complicated process? Because their operations have been disrupted and they're losing millions, if not billions of dollars. Now, it's also gonna have implications for social evaluations, such as reputation. Every crisis impacts your social evaluations, how people feel and think about you. So uh, calling it a reputational crisis in a way is redundant and confusing. This reputation is one type of social evaluation and one possible outcome that you can look at to see how well you're doing in crisis. And the other one is you're always going to involve social media in some way nowadays. But you can't let's say, oh, this was only on social media. Uh, now it probably spread. It's in the traditional media. And even if it starts in traditional, it's going to go social. So that's not a good distinction either. So let's kind of break down after a while way. So we're gonna be talking about operational crises today that happen in organizations. And these are some common ones that you might see happening. And so these are, these are serious problems for organizations. They're gonna disrupt you. You may have to shut down operations for one reason or another. And that might vary in the amount of time. It might be a few hours, it might be a few days, it might be longer, but all these represent these types of operational threats to organizations we have to take seriously think how do we deal with them. But along with that, you know, crisis communication really is sort of the public face of crisis management. And really it's a way to reduce the threat or the effects of a crisis when it's done right. And that becomes kind of a critical point that drives a lot of crisis communication research is how do we get to that point? How do we reduce the threat? How do we reduce the effects of a crisis? And that is the more interesting research because that's the applied part of it. You know, I, I like crisis communication because it came out of a need or a desire to make the practice better. And one of the things that attracted to me this years ago is uh, I was luckily in, in the 1990s, you know, that's how long ago, that's a long time now. Huh? Uh, there was this crisis conference out in Las Vegas and then hold it in the summer. So it'd be like 120 degrees. And it's, oh, don't worry, it's a dry heat. No, it was really hot. <laughs> but the best part was it'd be about 300 people and only five or six academics. The rest were all crisis practitioners. And I was really impressed with their desire to improve what they were doing and how they saw their job just to protect people. 
So I really liked the compassion they brought to it. And so at that time, you know, I was teaching in public relations. I thought, wow, this is, this is clearly the most interesting part of public relations. And you can really see an impact like, you know, like, okay, you can get out news releases and all right, we can talk about you know, publicity or something like that, which is great. But we're talking about maybe saving lives. Why not? That's a lot better. That, that seemed a lot more interesting to me. And so does that mean saying anything during a crisis is helpful for organizations and stakeholders? What do you think is, so I can, if I say anything, is that, is that good enough? No, right. So no. You, you know, yeah. Because you've seen some cases that, right? And uh, the Volkswagen case, to read, is, is a good example of that, which we'll return to in a bit. Sometimes people say really stupid things and you look at me like, wow, that's a good organization. How did they create such a bad response? You know, what were they, what were they thinking when they said that? Often I don't explain what they were thinking, but we know it, it doesn't always work. And so here's what you typically want to do in crisis. This is just kind of a hypothetical situation, but this is common that you find in data. This is the desired effect. So if you look there that you've, you've got this reputation, we're gonna focus on reputation, but this holds for your other important organizational outcomes. Another one for a lot of organizations is stock price. And you'll see the same pattern occur. But you're going along and you're doing pretty good. You're a five out of six, so you're happy. Well, then you have a crisis and you see you're dropping. You know, suddenly you're going down. And the idea is an effective response, you start to go up. And the long-term data that's been looked at, again, both reputationally within the industry and in terms of stock prices that's been done in the management literature shows if you use an optimal response, you come back faster and quick, you know, faster and stronger. And that's kind of the green line. Because the idea is if I didn't really do much, I'm just going to stay at a three. If I'm a good company, I'm eventually going to come back up to a five. So when, I, when I talk to managers, I say, yeah, what's your best asset in a crisis? Time. Because if, if you're a good organization, you're going to come back. Even from a horrific crisis, you see companies bounce back. You can think about Toyota and what they went through as an example of that. You know, they, they're coming back. And as badly as Volkswagen handled their crisis, they came back. At the same time, General Motors had a worse crisis. They came back, right? If you're solid going in, you're going to be solid coming out. But you also can do harm. So you come in and you give an ineffective crisis response, you can make it worse. It can drop down further. And... Uh, Finn Franson and Winnie Johansson refer to this as a double crisis, that you are so bad at talking during a crisis that you've made the crisis worse. And silence is somewhere in between the two. You know, silence is sort of that red line. You're just going to let it play out. You're not going to talk. You're just going to minimally give some communication response, but you're not going to actively engage in crisis communication. Well, that's going to be a cost to you. You're going to, it's a cost reputationally, but it's also a cost in terms of stock, and there's going to be a financial downside to that. So whether you choose silence or you engage in ineffective response, those are all suboptimal. And we really prefer optimal. And the reason being is there are benefits to crisis communication. From the organizational side, you rebound. Your social evaluations do better. Your media coverage changes. You can move it from negative, highly negative, a lot of coverage, to maybe not so much coverage, and maybe even a little bit positive at times. General Motors took a situation where they were actually killing their customers, and with their response, were suddenly hailed as this great reputation managing a great sort of crisis company that they could deal with this. Ignoring the fact that for a number of months prior to that, they had inadvertently killed some of their customers. Now, it also helps to protect and help the victims to recover. And this is both physical safety and psychological safety, which I'll talk a little bit more in, in just a bit. And that for me is one of the keys. And when, I, when I'm talking to managers and also at academic conferences, I talk about how your first priority is always your, the victims, your stakeholders that could be negatively impacted by this crisis. That's your first concern. And occasionally someone wants to dispute that, saying, oh, no, no, my first responsibility is to the organization. Well, 
from the very beginning, when I've talked with crisis managers, mostly what they have said is, we've got to think about the stakeholders first. We've got to protect people. That, yeah, we will benefit from that to our reputation, but our key concern is the physical and psychological safety of our stakeholders. And the companies that fail badly in crisis communication, forget that. They put the emphasis on themselves and not on the stakeholders. That's when you really run into problems and make mistakes. BP did that with the Deepwater Horizon. The first talk for, from BP was all about how, wow, we're losing a lot of money here. Isn't that terrible? People are going, no, we don't care if you're losing money. We care that you're polluting the beaches, that you're killing wildlife, that you're ruining people's sources of income from your actions. It's like, like, no, we're not too worried that your stock prices are dropping or that you're losing money on this one. So what that does is it comes to what we've been calling the optimal response. And I've, I've done a lot of work with a friend of mine in Belgium on Sophie Kleis, and she does a lot of work in the stealing thunder aspect of crisis communication. And we were working on some of the terminology and we were thinking, yeah, an optimal response, because you can have an optimal response, which is good, and suboptimal, so you just kind of bifurcate it, divide into two there. Excuse and me, so, I, may I ask a question? Sure. Uh, is there any other criteria to measure success in crisis communication? Because in those diagrams, um, mm -hmm. you measure the success by reputation. So yeah. I'm wondering if there is other measures. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good question. Because some of the other outcomes that are typically looked at, you'll look at um, such things as purchase intention, how that affect purchase intention of your stakeholders. Uh, you would also ask to see, look at negative word of mouth. Did it generate a lot of negative word of mouth or intentions to engage in negative word of mouth? And you can look more generally at what, what are called uh, supportive behaviors of the stakeholders. So how are the stakeholders then reacting to your communication efforts for the organization on those sides? Uh, there, it would be better if we had some, some good safety metrics on the other hand, but there's, there's not really a good set of normalized data to say, um, because we communicated in this way, we saved X numbers of, of lives. That would be better to know, but we don't have good metrics on that. So, so does that help you? There are, yeah, there's a lot of different ways to, to look at it. Because I, I think, I'm glad you brought that up because one of the problems is we focus too much on reputation and crisis communication and there's so much else going on there. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about a, a different, another option related to reputation towards them. We, we talk about infamy, which, Infamy is great. Uh, it comes out of the management side, but they came up with a really great term. So we'll look at them. And the idea in, a, in an optimal response is to maximize the benefits to stakeholders in the organization. And we've already talked about some of the organizational benefits, but from the stakeholder side, that really is their safety and really their resilience. Because when we're talking about the psychological effects, we're really talking about resilience on, on that end. And if you, you think about it, if you're a, a chemical manufacturing facility, you have a large responsibility for the safety of the people who live in and around your facility, in addition to your employees who work there. And if there is a chemical release, do people know what they should do? You're gonna give them some sort of alerting system and that's some combination of sirens and you know, you're gonna, you're gonna push out messages through your your notification systems are going to get texts, that sort of thing. And in some cases, it's even door to door if you're concerned that, you, that people may not know what to do. And you talk to them about that. That's what risk communication comes in so that you hear, okay, when you hear this siren or this message, you know what to do. Because when you have a, when, you're, when there's a hazardous chemical, you have two options. Now, the two options that we have had since the beginning of time as humans you either, either, either run, or you stay, you know, we have fight or flight. Well, you don't, you don't fight chemicals, but when you stay, you shelter in place. And so you go into your home and you seal it up. You know, turn off your air conditioning, turn off anything that draws in outside air versus, oh, you, you need to run. You need to evacuate, you need to get out of the area. Two very different things. And if you mix those up, that's a matter of life and death. That when you are told to shelter in place and you decide like, oh no, I'm gonna get in my car and I'm gonna outrun this. 
uh, that's when you die in your car. And these are some of the, the parts. So that's the early part of crisis communication is preparing people and preparing stakeholders to know what to do in the event of sort of a hazardous chemical release. The other time we see this effect on stakeholder safety is when there's product harm. You got a product and it's dangerous to people. And I like to use the example of the food industry because we can all relate to that because we all eat food. And we know maybe you're better with food safety in Australia than we are in the US. You know, we have <laughs> uh, in any given year, you're actually, your odds are like one in a thousand in the US of getting some type of food poisoning. It's, it's, it's not really good. But some of that's our own fault, but some of it's from the production process. You centralize production, you can have errors that compound. But if I'm a food company, I've got to tell you not to eat that product. Because it's in my best interest not to have you eat that product, be hospitalized, or die. So we, we both have an interest in you staying healthy and not eating a bad product. What's interesting, though, is that organizations rarely go the extra mile when they have a food recall. We've tracked this over a 10-year period. And somewhere less than 20% of the companies in the food industry, when they have a recall, will tell anyone on social media that they're having a recall. They rely upon the centralized governmental system to do it, which is all they required to by law, which is odd because that's not maximizing the benefits to your stakeholders. That's saying, I don't want to talk a lot about this recall. And the reason being is if I talk a lot about the recall, and I'm a publicly held company, I have stock, it's gonna hurt my stock more. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna not talk so much about it. And, and that's sometimes when you see some, maybe some ethical concerns about crisis communication, because in that case, the stakeholders were sort of being lost and dropped out of it. Uh, and that, that's a continuing problem that uh, even the FDA would like to see addressed because they encourage companies to do more than they actually do. And that's an example of when do stakeholders and organizational interests conflict in a crisis. On one hand, it's natural that they go together. Just think about it. If you're a manager of a company, do you want to be known as the company that killed its customers? Is that good for business? Is that a sustainable business model that you're creating there? You don't want to have that, that type of, of concern among your customers. But on the other hand, there are going to be financial pressures. So if you look at much of the research done on the management side that looks at the relationship between media coverage of a crisis and the negative financial implications for an organization, there's a very strong positive correlation. The more media coverage, the more negative it is for the organization. But what we do is it, it, at some point we have to accept that that's what happens, that your best response is to take a little bit bigger hit because on the, in the long term, it's, you're going to benefit. And that's a, a point that on Sophie and I have been looking at is this idea of long term versus short term and that you see a lot of mistakes made in crisis communication being driven by short term interests that are there. But again, why we think that organizations and stakeholders should most of the time have the same interest in a crisis. Uh, sometimes they don't. And it's going to come down to that. You know, you, you hate to divide it up that simply, but it's financial versus social. And sometimes financial side wins, unfortunately. Uh, any, I'm not going to go through all this, but these are just some of the optimal responses. Stealing thunder, when you can do it, you should do it. Be the first to disclose the existence of a crisis. If you want to talk about something that where you have amazing data to prove your point, but when you give it to managers and you ask them, will you do this? They're like, I don't know if I could sell this. This, this could be tough. And I've seen this um, from, from communication managers and I've seen this from CEOs. They're like, I see that data and that's compelling, but I don't know that I can do this. It's, it's, uh, there's still this hope. So if you're a manager and you don't disclose the existence of your crisis, what are you hoping is going to happen? What's your hope? What's your best possible outcome? 
well, I suppose what you're hoping is that everyone is going to um, not know about it, not talk about it, not spread it, not make it infinitely worse. Yes, and, and how likely is that in today's digital world? Um, I'd say between zip, zilch and nada. <laughs> right. There, it's, it's, it's a crazy course of action, but um, Aunt Sophie's done this research where she has interviewed the managers, and that's what they say, like, yeah, but if we don't say anything, there won't be a crisis. Uh, but there probably will be, and when there is, it's worse. But yeah, it's, so it's, it's strange, because the data for Stealing Thunder and it, it doesn't matter. And this is one that kind of crosses cultures. It works. If you can do it, do it. But managers are real hesitant at times. And then SCCT, kind of the, the work that I've been doing, we'd like to talk about kind of this ethical based response where you do instructing and adjusting information. And that's where your focus is on here's what you need to protect yourself physically. You know, how do you protect yourself physically? And then to help them adjust, adjusting information helps you to cope psychologically. And that's a, a way to build resilience. And it, it really aligns with some work being that's come out of uh, disaster research on the idea of psychological first aid that can help them recover. And curative actions are simply where you say, what steps are you taking to prevent a repeat of the crisis? Because as a victim or a potential victim, that's my main question. And that's where my anxiety comes from. And the work by Yan Jin has shown that anxiety is probably the most common emotion that comes out of a crisis. Because I'm worried that's going to happen again. Think about this. If you have eaten a type of food product, I'll give you an example in the US, peanut butter. We like our peanut butter. Some of you can actually eat Vegemite. I don't know how that would, that, that's kind of crazy to me, but you probably think peanut butter is crazy on our side. Well, I was loyal to one of the main brands and they poisoned me with salmonella about 12 years ago. I eventually went back to that brand because they talked about what they were doing to prevent it. Here in the state of Texas, there is this iconic ice cream brand called Bluebell and people were willing to sign waivers when it had its foodborne illness. They were willing to still buy contaminated ice cream and sign a waiver saying they wouldn't sue the company because they hated to go with that blue bell when it was pulled off the shelves. But they, again, talked about all the things they did to repair it. And that probably one of the best industries at this is the airline industry. When they have problems, they get curative action because yeah, people were kind of worried about flying planes after there have been crashes. I distinctly remember being in Jakarta after the the Boeing 747 MAX crashed and looking out there and thinking, okay, I'm not flying that airline, but and luckily I, I was flying on, a, that was when I was happy to fly on a really old looking plane. It's like, okay, that's safe. <laughs> we know that one works. It's not one of the new planes that, that were crashing. I mean, there's almost two years into it and they still can't, they still can't fly 747 MAX because they don't have curative actions for it. And then uh, what people tend to focus on with the optimal response is actually sort of the accommodation where you accept responsibility for the crisis and provide compensation. And that's, I think, really more of a minor factor. The main part is that ethical-based response to kind of get at the, the curative part of it. And in fact, in most crises, this is probably all you really need to have an optimal response. However, not all, the nature of crises can be different. Not all crises are the same. And they're not all the same, particularly in terms of intensity that are out there. Uh, so anything labeled a crisis is a serious threat. But that's what, uh, what, when I wanted to give you the context and talk about what some of the crisis managers told me, it's like, yeah, it, it's really, this, this means something special. All right, this is, this, is a, this, is, this is serious. It's not a bad day. Sometimes you have bad days at work, right? This is not a bad day. This is really something that demands a lot of time and attention. You are going to muster resources. You are going to call together your team and you're gonna focus attention on this to the exclusion typically of everything else in your organization. That's what a crisis is. Well, all right, so that's bad, but are all crises equally severe? Think about the crisis you've seen. We, do you think, yeah, it's a crisis, so they all have to be. So on a scale of one to 10, would you give them all 10? Probably not. We're going to kind of look at that. 
here's some ways to kind of think about that. The crisis communication think tank at the University of Georgia came up with a term called sticky crisis. And that's when you have a particularly complex and challenging crisis. So again, thinking probably not everything's a 10. We need to think about how we might start differentiating between crises and really bad crises, which seems like kind of odd in a way, because we're already, we're already bad at crisis. So you know, how, how can it get worse? Well, it can be. So here's a question about how severe it is. Right? There's an explosion that destroys a facility. That's bad, right? So we've got something severe that yeah. a crisis. Yeah. All right, now the explosion destroys your facilities and injures 25 people. So worse. That would be, so if we compare these, that one's worse. All right, the explosion destroys a facility and there are three fatalities. Right. Wow. So again, if we were looking at these, typically you say, okay, fatalities worse than injuries, right? So we're saying, okay, we can, we can look at this. But that's because we can compare it. And so unless you compare them, all these will be rated severe by people. And we did this, oh, I hate to say how long ago we, we, we collected data on that. <laughs> But people were just like, yeah, that's, that's bad. So you'd ask them to rate it. And we were just using one to seven. Like everything was a six or a seven. It, di it didn't matter. I mean, they very quickly went up to like, yeah, this is, this is bad. And again, yeah, that's a crisis. And so you, you needed to find a way, if you're familiar at all with the movie Spinal Tap, you needed to find a way to go from 10 to 11. How do, how do we do that? How do we, how do we differentiate that? Because the problem is we experience crises in isolation, not through comparison. So any one of these appears and people are gonna think, Dad, this is just really bad. But we know from a crisis manager, if you see across these, we know there's, there's, there's gonna be differences in them. And this is an example, one option of severity and didn't use the pain scale, but this is an example of it, of just the type of scale you might have. Everything was skewed to the high end, all right? You, you weren't getting a spread. People weren't saying like, oh yeah, that was like a, a moderate crisis. No, they were all up at, at the high end. So it, it skewed the data. It's like, well, that wasn't, asking people just to kind of evaluate severity didn't seem to work. That, that, didn't, that didn't give us the distinction we wanted between crises. And some, some other ideas were being used out there too. Some people looked at susceptibility and there are a few other measures, but they tended to get the same results. They kind of skewed towards one end. And it wasn't until by accident discovered something else. And the something else came out of cognitive appraisal theory. And I, I like when, when research is theory driven, that there's a rationale behind what you're doing and hopefully your results match up with your theory and your predictions that they don't always do that. In fact, uh, some of what we're now looking at is all because of anomalous findings that kind of baffled why they came out that way. And cognitive appraisal theory says, you know, when you're in a situation, you, you look around and there are certain cues you're gonna pick up on, certain features in the situation. And those cues, depending how they line up, are gonna lead you to feel certain emotions. Now, will everyone feel the same emotions when they get the same cues? No, but the research shows Certain cues are more likely to produce emotions among most people than others. I, say, I, want, I want to say that up front because it, there's always going to be people who see the world differently and they don't share that. And we'll talk some about that with infamy as well. And because of those emotions, those trigger certain behaviors. So we know that emotions are, are good motivators for behaviors. We'll talk about that. And one, I want to start by kind of talking about how that relates to really sort of, you know, anger as an emotion. So emotions come from the evaluations of the events. And crises are those types of situations and they can create emotions. And early on, you know, there are a number of us were looking at emotions and we were picking up anger and sometimes sympathy for that. And e even now there's some research looking at empathy related to kind of crises and, and what's going on in organizations for these emotions. I mentioned earlier, uh, Jan's work found Anxiety is produced quite a bit. That, that's kind of an offshoot of crises. If, if you want evidence of that, just look around you for COVID-19. Anxiety drives pretty much everything. Yeah, 
I'm sitting here and I haven't had a haircut in uh, almost five months because um, when I look on the scale of dangerous things to do, getting a haircut's like right up near the top. It's like, oh, yeah, it's not worth that. But I'll let my hair look bad. So they're motivational, they're triggers to action. And we've seen that even in the, the research in health communication that have looked at triggers that going back to the 1950s and then fear appeals and modifications of fears that how they can, these emotions can really lead us in certain directions. And, and that's why they're important. Because if, if you just had the emotion and it was there and it was gone and it didn't impact your behavior, we wouldn't worry as much about it. But now we're worried about that behavior. Again, think back that there's been a crisis. You're anxious about it. And now you don't buy that product. You don't use that service. It impacts your behavior in some way. Or it makes you angry at the company and not only do you not buy their product, but you tell your friends not to buy their product. There's things that happen there. And anger, that's a common one. And that's one we looked at early on because that was established within the attribution literature. And SCCT is, is born out of attribution theory and its application in communication. And anger cues are that another person has to be responsible for the negative event. So you don't get mad at an organization when they don't have the crisis. You get mad when the, the crisis and it's their fault. Uh, the, the reason certain crises aren't as challenging for organizations, for instance, workplace violence or product tampering, those are bad. And th th those have often deadly consequences for your stakeholders, including your employees. But you don't blame the organization for that. You, you blame these outside forces who are responsible for it. So there's less anger. In fact, you often get sympathy for the organizations in those, in, for those types of crises. Then yourself or someone you care for has been injured or offended. So you, you can be the sort of general sense that it was someone you knew or just you see the victims in the media and you feel you feel anger because those people were wronged in some way, even though you really don't know them. You, you can even extend it that way. So th this anger can be this powerful cue and it motivates people. And it's, it's one of the motivators that leads people to engage in negative word of mouth. And that used to be, you know, sending nasty letters or calls or emails to companies. And now you go out and you attack them on social media. So you, you want to really, that's, you want to really give them some pain. So you're going to go and you're going to, go out on their own Facebook page and make them feel the pain from your anger that's out there. It's, it's, it's been, yeah, yeah, social media has got a, a lot of interesting applications in crises. So it's gonna motivate you. It's gonna motivate you to change the situation. That might mean I'm not gonna buy that product, I'm not gonna use that service. Or you might act against something and that something is the organization. Again, you, you don't buy, you encourage others not to buy, you post negative messages about that organization and to kind of get that, to get that point across. So it's, it's a strong motivator. Uh, but again, it, anger doesn't help to differentiate a lot between crises because if you can, just like severity can happen pretty quickly, anger can happen pretty quickly. And that's almost, to, to in some ways that's almost sort of a personality trait some people are quicker to anger than others but we find that people will rate anger pretty highly pretty quickly too and so it again it kind of skews towards that end of yeah crisis makes me angry you know, like the hulk the hulk when the hulk gets mad the, the, cons the stakeholders get mad and that's when we wound up with moral outrage uh, here just kind of how we got to moral outrage. This is just to kind of show you, sometimes you never know research, where research is going to take you. You're going one direction and suddenly you're in another. Well, a few years ago, there was this conference and it was a conference all about scandals. And it was in Bamberg, Germany. Uh, and Sherry Holiday and I thought, oh, wow, hey, that's, that's an interesting topic, scandals. And that relates to crisis work. I would really like to go to Bamberg's. So let's go to this conference. So we, we, we looked at kind of the relationship between scandal and crisis, and we came up with this term, which I'll introduce you to here in a minute, the scansis. And we went and kind of based upon theory, came up with some ideas about how a scansis affects crisis communication. 
And we did a study to test those beliefs and it failed miserably. We did not get the results at all we thought we were. And like, we got to figure out why, what's going on here? You know, it's, and can, it, the experiment was done. We, it wasn't in the design of the experiment. It wasn't in the subject pool. We just knew there was a different dynamic happening here than we thought would, and we explored it. And it, it took us to this the emotion of moral outrage. So the big question is, what is moral outrage and how does it differ from anger? It is different from, different from anger. And the key there is, is, in, is in the definition, right? It's moral. Suddenly this is a, a moral issue. This isn't just anger over something that's happening. You're, this is anger about some sort of moral violation, something that, that you see differently. It was interesting to read about moral outrage for about five or six years, the psychologists debated whether or not it existed until finally, and I ha had you read uh, the piece where they actually were able to assess it. And once they could measure it and they proved it exists, that was a big breakthrough. So one of the, the, the piece by Antonetti, that was once like, yeah, that now it really does exist. You know, we, we can put that debate to rest. It's like back in, in the 90s when they debated in PR whether or not reputation mattered. You, know, you had to have data, you had to assess it in some way. And moral outrage is unique because it's a combination. And here's Antonetti and Macklin's study. It's injustice, and they called it greed, but a better term for it might be exploitation. That when you see this crisis, it's an injustice that stakeholders have been wronged in some way. But not only that, they've been exploited. This is a function of corporate greed. And there might be some personality traits and, some, and this sort of a, a bias people might have against organizations that lead them more quickly to moral outrage. You know, that's still a subject that can be researched. But when this more, moral outrage emerges from a crisis, it changes things. It changes things dramatically in terms of crisis communication. And that's, and that's what we had not anticipated uh, when we were first thinking about scandals and crises. Because the scandal brings in that moral component to it. Is, uh, too oftentimes people were saying, they'd use the term scandal and crisis interchangeably. Like, this is a scandal, this is a crisis. So you'd read an article and it'd be like, three times it's a scandal and twice it's a crisis. Like, we're like, nah, that's not right. That, you know, there are some crises that just aren't scandals. Uh, and you can probably have a scandal that's not a crisis. But, you know, it's, they, are, they are connected. So here's a question I, okay. I would post. Can crisis communication solve all problems during a crisis? What would you say? Tim, I was actually hoping to ask a question just based on your last slide, if I could. Yeah, go ahead. It, it seems um, an unusually narrow definition on, in terms of moral outrage, the injustice tied to, to greed. And I just wonder, and I got this when I was reading your, your study in particular, to what extent um, it can be used in reference to say the Me Too movement and uh, uh, toxic cultures that go bad. And so we've got mm -hmm. scandals of a different nature, more salacious sex and drug scandals and, and yes, yeah, less tied to finance and, and, and organizational greed. Yeah, and, and that's, I think what makes the difference. And that's why we, we wanted to use the term scandals because some scandals are, they're just sort of like, they're um, for lack of a better word, they're sexy they're gonna draw people in. Yeah, they have that kind of, there's some kind of like, yeah, there's drugs or something else going on there. And so that's gonna be a different type of emotion. It's not really gonna get so much the moral outrage. And in fact, oftentimes people in certain types of scandals with public figures don't even get to the part of outrage at all. They're just sort of like, it's more fascination than that. And um, some of the work that's, that, um, that was done on political scandals shows that like over time, like if there's like three or four of the same type of scandal, the first one's a scandal, then people in the media lose interest in like the second and the third one. And then it doesn't really hit that same level of impact. And I think that's what you, that's why, you know, we wanted to kind of narrow the focus of scandal. And you're right, it is, it's purposely narrow, moral outrage is purposely narrow. And 
there, I think there can be other factors like moral outrage that produce the same sort of extreme effect for crises. And those need to be found and those need to be explored. So, uh, so I, I don't think this is like the, the solution to everything. This is a solution to one part of it that's there. But, but you're right, it, it, is, it is narrow and it's narrow for a reason to see what happens within that band there. But there are others. And one of the things that I, I've, we have a little bit of data on this. So it's, and this actually was pre, uh, pre the situation with the, the really explosion of the Black Lives Movement in the US is that race is a factor that dramatically changes a crisis. When there's a, a racial dimension to it, and it looks as though there's purposeful discrimination involved, that isn't necessarily moral outrage that's making the difference there, but your perception of discrimination that does. And so there are these other factors. And I think that's, there, there, can, there can be these other factors that we need to identify. And the more we identify, I think the more beneficial they'll be to the crisis communicators who are involved with that. Was that? Yeah, it does. It does answer my question. It's just hard not to think of the, the cases regarding Harvey Weinstein and, uh, <laughs> and, and other people as not, you know, triggering moral outrage of, of a different yeah. kind. And yeah, but I take yeah. your point of, of needing to narrow it and there are further trails mm -hmm. to be explored. But so thank you. Was a good yeah, I think Me Too does fit the moral outrage one very clearly because there is exploitation for gain, but in that case it was personal gain. Yeah, as a, as a, and that's why exploitation might work better than greed, because if you were to more generalize exploitation, it could cover other categories. So you've exploited, you know, in Weinstein's case, he's exploited the women. You know? And so, or you exploited someone according to race. So you could, ex, you can exploit on more dimensions. And that, that's probably a richer dimension than, than just greed. Uh, does an apology magically fix everything? Yeah, no. not, in, not in politics. You always had to offer, offer up a sacrificial lamb. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, 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 want, uh, they want blood, all right? They want somebody's blood. And that's why a lot of times you know, during crises, like the CEO, he or she goes. You know, someone, someone's, gotta, someone's gotta pay for this. Well, yeah. At, Oddly though, I, I've seen people offer this up. I, I remember once I was reading and it was, it was actually this, a terrible political scandal in the United States. And they're like, well, if this person had just apologized, everything would have been fine. And I'm just thinking, no, it wouldn't have been. You know, this person was perhaps implicated in the murder of another person and you just apologize and you think it's magically fixed. It's like, no, uh, apologies aren't magic, but Apologies have been given this sort of mythical and more of so this magical quality. It's like, yeah, we apologize. And so you can, people talk about well, how good was the apology? And it's like, ah, oh, there's limits to this stuff. It's like, no, it's, there's a problem. We've, we've known this all along, but because so many of the academic cases say, oh, the apology is the reason this worked, that it gets this mythic magical quality. So yeah, we'll just sprinkle a little apology on that and everything's going to be good. No, it's not. I, I, one of the, the first pieces I read to address this was a piece that looked at the Catholic church scandal in the U.S. And that's the abuse of, of, of young boys that had been going on for decades and covered up by the church. So a church would have problems with the priest. Instead of really doing something about it, they would just move the priest to another diocese where he would continue to abuse children. Well, their conclusion was not an apology will magically fix everything. Their conclusion was sometimes you have to embrace the pain. So it's like, all right, you've got to just say, we were horribly wrong. Whatever you do to us, we deserve. And you know, like, and just kind of try to move through it that way. And that I read that and I'm like, yeah, th this is, they're right. And, and, and they use some strange French term to explain it. But um, we decided to go with more with moral outrage in, instead of the French, French variations there. But what we kind of argue is that the moral outrage created a boundary condition for SCCT. 
And there were some hints that there were, this was going on anyway. Because what was happening is that in, in SCCT, when, we, when you're doing research on the preventable crisis cluster, in that cluster, the results were always mixed. Sometimes the strategies worked, sometimes they didn't. And retrospectively looking at those studies, it really is gonna come down to moral outrage as a boundary condition. So once you factor in moral outrage, the theory changes. It, cheeries, it, it changes what the theory can do and it affects the practice, what you can expect coming out on the other side as a crisis communicator. And that's when we talk about this new crisis type as a scansis, that, that drove this research, but we've expanded it beyond just scansis, but that, this is, was the trigger point. I was, you know, when I was saying that, well, we wanted to, we had this concept, we wanted to research it further and the research didn't turn out the way we thought. So we had to find out why and moral outrage explained that failure. And so when we did later, a number of later experiments related to it, bringing in moral outrage, we would get the same results when now we had an explanatory tool for it. So we could show how moral outrage, and I'll, I'll kind of walk you through some of that. If you're not really into, I won't get into the details of the experiments because very few people just like to talk experimental design. All right, so what we did is this is a, a fusion of a crisis and a scandal. So we're saying, yeah, that there, there's a crisis and there's scandals. They're not necessarily equivalent, but we put them together. And so our argument is that a scandal, the scandal aspect transmogrifies the crisis. And to transmogrify something means to change it into a more grotesque negative sense. And so a scansis is just kind of this really twisted bad crisis. So it's not just a crisis. When it's a scantus, it's going to be a lot worse. And that a scantus is largely socially constructed. And again, this follows from the political research that says, if people don't define a politician's behavior as scandalous, it's not a scandal. Even though maybe a year ago, you said that was a scandal for someone else, for this person, eh, no, it's not a scandal. And th there, there was some some interesting research on, on the political side in that direction. And that's where the moral aspect of it and was coming out because the scandal literature, while like the crisis literature, they don't agree on a definition of their central term. They do agree that there's always some sort of moral component to a scandal. That, that's what they'll agree upon. How, how you then go through beyond that definition is up for grabs. Here are some examples of scansis in action, all right? Um, go back to an old case, it was a good one, Sears. Years ago, Sears at one point in time was like the retailer in the United States. When I was growing up, there was a Sears everywhere and that's where people went. When I was growing up, the only credit card my father had was a Sears credit card. Every other place he'd play cash, but he might go to Sears and buy something like tools that were cost a lot more. They had an automotive repair component to Sears. And what was going on is people would bring their cars in and they would be told, oh, hey, you need new brakes. Put new brakes on the car. Well, it turns out those cars didn't need new brakes. And they did an undercover investigation out west that exposed this. It was done by a state's attorney's general's office. They would take a car in, they knew what was right and wrong with it. And Sears was recommending fixes that they knew the car really didn't need. And so Sears got caught in this and it was, it was a big crisis for them and our goods, it's a scansis because it's clearly, it's an injustice to your customers. And why did you do it? It was motivated by corporate greed. They wanted to make money, it was exploitation. Tim, Mylan, Tim can I ask you just for a second? I know uh, we can come back to this, but we have uh, sometimes people who have to leave for classes and stuff and okay. Anne Lane uh, has to leave, but she had a question she wanted to ask before she sure. left, it's okay? Yeah, that's fine. I'm sorry to interrupt the flow here, Tim, because it's it's a fascinating okay. track that you're on. But this question's been bugging me for a few slides now, and I really need an answer before I can go on and teach. So, um, <laughs> I was just reflecting back on your ideas about that uh, optimal crisis response and the suboptimal mm -hmm. one. So, my question is, how is that affected by where we are on the the timeline of the crisis, if you like? So. Is it affected by whether the crisis is still unrolling and unraveling or whether we've reached the end of the crisis and we've got all the information that we need to fully understand what happened? Because I was looking at those responses and thinking I can see where 
if you're making them in the heat of the crisis where perhaps you, you don't have that fuller picture, it could be quite suboptimal unintentionally. Uh, right. You, you never want to go too far too soon. And that's when you're, when you're around crisis manager, you learn that they, they wait until they act, they act when they actually have to on those ones. And that's why the, um, the idea that ethical based responses is very easy to use because there's nothing controversial that's not going to hurt you. But later on, if you're going to go further, you're going to do compensation or get it, or you're, you're going to define this as scantus, you need to know that's what's emerging. And part of it is you're going to see that emerge in the discourse around the crisis. It's going to come out. And you're going to see these cues are going to emerge that this is how media and your stakeholders are defining the crisis and that's going to be the crisis you're going to have to live with but that can change over time and it can change for the worse usually that at first you don't know how bad it is but then you do i get yeah. in these cases sears thought they didn't have a problem until it was exposed now these other two ones uh, they kind of knew immediately they had a problem but you're right sometimes you don't and it might be a week or a couple of weeks later, something happens that dramatically changes and redefines that crisis for you and your optimal response will change. And yeah. that's why uh, you can't go, uh, uh, some organizations go too quick to the apology and say, ah, you, you might wanna wait on that. Because the, there's been some research done in psychology that's shown that if you apologize for something that you're not really responsible for, that's actually harmful for you. Yeah, so the, the example- That's a good question. Um, just here in Australia, we had a, an incident a little while ago now with uh, needles appearing in strawberries, packaged strawberries in supermarkets. And it was quite fascinating to watch what happened there because the crisis response initially was the organisation putting down a complete stop on their production, investigating all their machinery, uh, looking for where their responsibility lay and, and speaking about that in public quite extensively. When things began to resolve and the nature of the crisis became clear, it was actually a number of um, mentally challenged individuals, shall we say, who thought it was a jolly good idea at the time. So there was this poor organization responding in textbook fashion, mm -hmm. you know, saying, we're really sorry this has happened. Your safety is our priority. We won't do any more production and, and assuming responsibility for something that wasn't theirs. But your answer mm -hmm. does actually deal with that. So I very much appreciate that. Thank you. Sorry for interrupting you. No, but no, that, that's a really good point. And when, it's, when the safety is at such a risk, yeah, you have to kind of err on the side of that. And you'll, you'll see a lot of people, uh, that, that gets questioned. The companies seem very quick. Will, will they have to? Because they know if they wait too long, it's far worse for them. It's like, yeah. okay, let's get this out. Because we don't know. Because like, maybe something went wrong in our process. They probably, had a, they probably had a feeling whether or not that was the case. Mm. But they... they, they Sometimes you just don't know. I mean, weird stuff winds up in food. Pieces of glass, bits of metal, chunks of rubber. And it's like, oh, that's not good. <laughs> really not good, no. Yeah. Thank you for your answer. I'm sorry to have to leave so early, but I'm going to go off and teach with new enthusiasm with all this now. Thank you. OK. Yeah, uh, Mylan makes the EpiPen. And if you know anyone who's allergic, they probably have an EpiPen. They jacked up the price 400%. 400%. That created problems because their cost hadn't gone up, but they wanted their profit to go up. And Wells Fargo opened accounts and started charging customers for accounts the customers never knew they had. As one of those cases, have you ever heard like the plots in the movies where, well, if there's a million customers and we take a, a you know 50 cents from each one, we can make you know 500 million. That's kind of what Wells Fargo did. No one noticed it was like it was cents on the dollar for each of these accounts. But when you've got millions of them, it adds up. And so they got caught. And again, that was greed. Myland got reported that was greed, exploitation of people who desperately needed that. I mean, you, you can't just say, oh, yeah, I'm not going to have an EpiPen when that could be the difference between your life and your death. So th th these are all kind of, these are all sort of, would be sort of textbook scans this that related and created more outrage. And we, we've tested each of these, and you do, you see this, you can, it's much different in terms of moral outrage than some of the other types of crisis we were running by people. And didn't the man there. CEO go to jail too now? Oh, the which one? The guy, the Milan guy, the, the guy who was behind all that in the first place? I, I, um, I think that was another pharmaceutical company guy, but at the same time did the same thing, jacked up the price. He went into, he did go to prison, yeah. The, the other price hiker went to prison. Yeah. 
Mylan kind of skated by because their CEO is like incredibly well connected in politics. But, uh, but at the same time, another company, another pharmaceutical company did the same thing. And yeah, um, he was referred, I think he's the one they called the pharma, the pharma bro. He, he's, he's in prison now. So that's good. Not too many go to prison. It's nice when they finally get that. So what we found is when there's a scansis, um, the recommended responses had no effect. You looked at post-crisis reputation, no difference. Purchase intention, no difference. Negative word of mouth, no difference. That's no different than if you gave a suboptimal response or silence, no response. That it, it, it didn't matter. It, it wasn't having any sort of positive effect on this. And that's when we started thinking, yeah, this is the boundary condition that the moral outrage is what's changing it because these strategies will work in lesser crises, but not in these. And the question then became, what types of crises do most people perceive as extreme? And, you know, so that, that's what we began to explore because we knew Scansis definitely did, but Scansis isn't the only potential candidate out there. Uh, Scansis were closely related to another one. And this is generally a preventable crisis is the most extreme in SCCT, because in SCCT divided up, you got those that are like very little response, crisis responsibility, we use that to group the crises, kind of moderate and then high levels of crisis responsibility, this is the preventable crisis. And in that there was human error, management misconduct and scansis. And so we knew down here, scansis definitely did it. And we had a feeling management misconduct might too, because management conduct is closely related to scansis, that you know, if you take management misconduct, that's always kind of an injustice. You throw in a little bit of greed, uh, then you're going to wind up with the scansis sort of thing. And that was in the original conceptualization of scansis is that they probably evolved out, you know, they were a management misconduct gone even worse. Then there was human error. And all along, we always kind of thought, you know, human error and management misconduct, they're really kind of qualitatively different but the data we had put them together, that they had these same levels of crisis responsibility. But they're, they're different in part because there's an intentionality in management misconduct. You knew what you were doing was wrong and you did it anyway. You engaged in harassment, you engaged in discrimination, you engaged in siphoning money from your organization. But human error, that was for when employees made mistakes, you know, a chemical delivery is made and your employee starts, hooks up the hose, the chemical starts going into the tank in the ground and the employee looks up and realizes, wrong tank, I'm mixing chemicals. And in one case for Ford, that was bad because it blew up, luckily no one was injured in that. This stuff happens, employees make mistakes. I, I it's, it's, because it always seems a bit unfair that we, we hold like the organization should be 100% perfect. And I, I've never worked in the organization where I'd, I'd swear by everyone who worked there that they weren't going to make a mistake. And so we always thought there's a little bit difference there. Because again, with the intentionality and human error is kind of more technical. It, it's, it's your skill ability versus management misconduct is more about your character, really. And so we thought, yeah, there, there, there could be a, a difference there. Yeah. May I ask a question? And yeah. um, sometimes the result of a human error is more severe than a scansis or management misconduct. For example, yes. a lot of people die. Mm -hmm. So why are we categorizing these items based on cause and attribution of responsibility rather than result? Is that's, that has the biggest impact upon the effect of the communication then. It comes back to the, the, the communication aspect of it. So I, again, that's why it, the human error can be more severe in terms of a total amount of damage or deaths, but how it happened matters to how people then react and interpret and react to your crisis responses, um, which, which seems odd, but that's, 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 where, that's where it's coming from, that they, while the damage might be greater they see it a little bit differently and they're willing to give you um, sort, of, sort of more leeway than, than if it's purposeful. 
Because I still think it, on some level, people realize that human error happens, but still they think it, it shouldn't, that you know, if, if managers were doing their jobs, there would be no human error is, is kind of is what the data shows us. But yeah, that's that's a good point. Yeah, human error can be can be terribly bad in, in terms of their outcome. But it changes the communication dynamic with your stakeholders. And so what we found is there really were these three distinct sub crises when you started using moral outrage that that you had. And it's a, a new sort of appraisal that typically we were saying, okay, when we were using the base for SCCT, there were two appraisals made. The situation is negative, it's bad. Right? So you've got a bad situation when it's negative, you think, okay, why? Who's responsible for this? And you make the responsibility assessment. So down in here. But we're seeing this, you add moral outrage, now we can explain more about what's going on. Because responsibility only took us so far. And moral outrage could help us explain more of what we were seeing in the data and how people were responding for it. And so what it did is it really kind of created a cutoff that human error was, yeah, it's human error is bad. And as you point out, it could be really, really bad. But it is qualitatively different because of moral outrage than management misconduct and scantus. And while these are different, like this is scantus produces the most moral outrage. Once you start getting up to this level of management misconduct, you're there. You you have reached you've reached the extreme point. Right, you, you are now bad. So even if you go to scans, it's like, yeah, it might look a little bit worse, but really kind of the same boat we're in here with these two is what we found. And um, been, been looking very closely, there's been a series of four experiments and yeah, really these, these two kind of have the same effect. You kind of have this threshold level that once you cross with moral outrage, it's gonna, it's gonna impact you, whether it's, now, if you think about it, that this is this is a five and this is a seven, it doesn't matter. Once you hit five, it's kind of bad. And the idea was that then, how do you identify the cues? What are the cues in the situation that lead to moral moral outrage? And again, those are how is it being talked about? How is it being framed? The crisis is being framed through those cues. And you know, are you seeing it as exploitation? Is that is that appearing in the discourse? The cues are there and you're seeing injustice. And the injustice part is pretty easy because that's that occurs in a lot of crises once you get to this upper period, you're gonna, you're gonna this upper level because you're gonna hold them responsible. But the idea of this, the exploitation emerging is very critical to all of that. Uh, and I like, and I, but I, I like, I liked your point earlier, Mitchell, that yeah, that um, must broaden exploitation beyond just financial because that, that 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 could be i mean i think that's a really that's a really valid point that it, it, it fits in with some of the other research that we've been doing with some related factors so the optimum response only has an effect in the human relation error crisis so this is like product harm and industrial accidents again um the cases might be the employee is driving a forklift they're not real good with the forklift. They hit this pipe and the pipe has Freon because you're a frozen foods company. The Freon releases, they've got to evacuate the building, they got to shut down, they, they got to, they're shut down where they clean it up. You know, some people are treated for breathing in the Freon. Yeah, that, that's, that's different than where management purposely told the workers, hey, you see this safety routine? Don't follow that. Instead, take a shortcut. They take the shortcut, there's an explosion, people are injured. That's management misconduct, that's different. So that, that, that's a different idea that's going on there. So we finally did get to see that nice distinction and it's good because in the psychological trust literature, their trust violation literature, there's a distinction between when a violation is based upon kind of skill versus one that's based upon character. And, and that's what was sort of reflected too in this distinction. So it started to fit better with data and theories from, from other, from related areas as well. So Sorry, I've just, got a, I've yeah. just got a quick question on that. Does the identity of the victim matter at all? 
Um, I'm just thinking of a particular case that we recently had in Australia where um, they hooked up the wrong kind of gas to a neonatal, neonatal unit. And so instead of the babies being given oxygen, they were given nitrous oxide and they died. Mm. So it was a human mistake, but it's babies. <laughs> yeah, I think, and that, that's what I was going to say. If it involves children, yeah, I, I think that that might be an, another component. And I, I think that that's going to create, I, I don't know if it's necessarily outrage, but it's going to be another type of emotion that's well beyond anger and is going to lead to some of these problems. And I, I think that's another one that, that would be it. Because it's, yeah, if, if you're, if you, if you want to see the most cautious organizations in the United States are companies that deal with baby food and baby furniture. Because yeah, you, you don't want to be the company that their you know, the product, you know, like it killed children. I mean that, yeah, that's, yeah, that there is something unique in that dynamic too that's going on. So you, you're right. Yeah. It, I, I think it, when the identity or children are a particularly vulnerable public, I think you're going to, I think you're going to see a, a different type of reaction as well. And I, th I think that's something to consider. Well, Graco, the big baby furniture manufacturer, used to have a recall every month practically. So I think there's some out there who are pretty sloppy about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you wonder how some of these places stay in business. You, know, like, like you just don't want to mess with babies. Because Ikea had that issue with the uh, dresser that fell over and, and killed a child. And yeah. You can, you can wind up with some, some bad situations for these. But um, one of the questions, th this is a question we were worried about because in crisis research, you want to take this out to the practice and you want to make sure that it isn't used in the wrong way. <laughs> and I'm going to use another example of this here in a bit. And one of our concerns was when we were writing this up is that people were going to think a suboptimal response is fine. Like, well, there's no difference. I don't get any benefit from an optimal response, so I can say nothing, or I can give you just kind of a half-hearted response, which, uh, which we typically use. We just use what's called an information-only response. All you do is you just give out some information, that's, that's it, which is, is common. And it's a suboptimal strategy. It's, it's not perfect, but it's not horrible. It's, it's not intentionally going to make things worse. So we're not, you're not doing, you're not saying anything. We want to, we want to make it a fair test. We want, we don't want a, a suboptimal response is so bad that that's going to create the problem. We want a suboptimal response that does occur and on the surface, not going to hurt you, but may not help you. And so the information response was, was that condition. So we're like, oh no, people are going to think that's what you should do. Like, eh, cause that's, that's not, that's not where, that's not where we think this should go. And we, our explanation is there's a risk of infamy with the suboptimal response. And infamy is a great concept. Um, Farrer and some others have come up with this and Farrer is a, he's a, um, he's a management researcher at the University of Georgia. And I said, infamy is a form of social disapproval. So when we think of reputations, we think of reputations can range from positive to negative. Infamy is negative. It is social disapproval. The opposite, the counterpart to infamy is celebrity, where you have, it's a form of social approval where they really like you. And to show you how interpretations matter, their argument is that certain behaviors, you know, I'm not talking about crises, can cause some people to view an organization as a celebrity and others to view it in infamy because it's just how they interpret the information. But in crises, it can take you towards infamy because what the crisis says is, yeah, maybe this company's not so good. Because what you do is with uh, infamy, there's also a high level of attention from the media. Your constituents are focused on it. And it generates negative emotions towards the organization. So when you hear the name, you think, bad. Like, this, this company is infamous. And what their research suggests is infamy has a pretty long shelf life that we often think, oh, a crisis is a quick hit and goes away. Infamy doesn't. Infamy is kind of self-sustaining. That infamous companies stay infamous for a long time. And so crisis is one route 
that you become infamous. And there are other ways as well, but infamy is one route. And so that's one piece of data for your stakeholders. So they see your crisis and like, okay, yeah, you're a bad company. Second piece of data, if we think of people as scientists, second piece of data is your response. So I've had a crisis, I've done badly. I give a not very good response. Well, that's another piece of data that suggests you're not a very good company. And so what it does is it keeps moving you towards infamy. And the, the really dangerous part of infamy, as we'll see in a minute, is really de-identification. So can you think of any crisis that made an organization infamous for you? Can you think of any infamous organizations? I'm just curious if there's any out there you, you feel are infamous. Probably Russian ever. government is one, <laughs> is one <laughs> infamous organization. <laughs> In, in Australia, we had James Hardy. They were mining asbestos for years, uh, aware of the, the fact that it was leading to asbestosis, a form of cancer. So certainly James Hardy is an infamous company in Australia. Probably Enron. I don't think I would actually know who Enron was if it wasn't for the situation. So. Yeah. Yeah, Enron's a really good one for, 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 for being infamous. Yeah, man. Um, I still, um, the head of, Ken Lay died before he could be sentenced. And in, in US, that means then you're not guilty if you die before you're sentenced, because he was, he was convicted, but before he could be sentenced, he died, which meant that his family got to keep all of his assets. They weren't then given back for people who were affected by the Enron, uh, the Enron situation, which I always wondered maybe if his family killed him, but I don't know, that was, that was never proven. So <laughs> that's a conspiracy. Yeah, so you can get infamous companies, you know, they're, they're, they're out there. You know, most companies don't go to infamy, but it's, it's a possibility. But the nice about infamy is, infamy sort of captures what happens in a crisis because infamy is immediate and it's effective and that's what we're talking about here it's an immediate response in a crisis and it's effective reputation is more over time and more rational if, you, if you're kind of looking at how they're conceptualized so they're both social evaluations but infamy probably better captures what might happen to an organization in a crisis so yeah we know reputation you know we have some indicators of it but maybe we're actually capturing infamy more than reputation after a crisis. Because again, they're both social evaluations, they're both, they're both potential outcomes for that. And the bad thing about what you have with infamy is infamy is all about value incongruence. And that's, this is a very disturbing dynamic for an organization. Because what it is saying is that prior to a crisis, you, the organization, the stakeholders, realize we've got some values we have in common. That, yeah, you're like me, right? So that's why I like you. That's why I buy your products, why I buy your, your services. I mean, yeah, on some level, you, I mean, obviously, I like your product is working for me. I mean, if it's not, you shouldn't keep buying it. But what happens with infamy is you start separating them out. You see that company, you see, oh, that moral violation you did, that stuff, that's not me. So no, you, you and I aren't as much as like as I thought. And so there's this disidentification. This will be for, this could be your customers, this could be your investors, this can be people in the community, this can be your employees. And that's dangerous. This identification is going to be a significant damage to your relationship and how you're they going to interact with, with the organization in the future. So that's a big risk. But what this also points out is you're asking earlier, what are some of the outcomes we should look for in a crisis? When, it's, when you're talking about moral outrage, value congruence suddenly becomes an important outcome for you and kind of looking at what's going on. So the next question in the research is how can communication allow organizations to survive these extreme crises? And what we've started to look at is your crisis communication has to recognize the moral violation. If you just give the standard apology, oh yeah, we, you know, we, we were bad, we, you know, we take responsibility for this. You know, we're going to do better in the future. Uh, that's not going to make it. You've got to tell us why. You know what you did wrong. You know what 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 did you do wrong? 
you have to ex explicitly say we violated whatever moral point it is and talk about how you're going to overcome that. You've got to recognize the moral violation. And the data supported that when you recognize the moral violation, you actually can see some benefits then. You're not going to see the typical benefits. Again, none of this is going to move like reputation, purchase attention, or negative word of mouth. Those are still going to be unmoved because it just moral outrage, it's, it's hard to then get some positive effect on those typical outcomes. Dr. Coombs, may I ask a question? Yeah. Sure. Um, I was thinking about this for a little bit at this point. I really like that my question comes up to your point about how there needs to be value and congruence between the stakeholders and the organization. Um, I really like to think of stakeholders as of, as of multiple groups. So it's not mm -hmm. just, you know, a mass of people out there, but they all have faces and they all are also different in their interests, in, in their values, in, in their attitudes or towards the organization. My question comes to, and Dr. Ken gave a good example, Donald Trump. This person has done lots of things that would be considered immoral. And sometimes it gets to, it's so moral, it's so bad that people don't believe it. So they, especially those who really like Trump and who trust him, they would say, that's just no way, or that was a joke, or that, you know, that didn't happen. And I know there is some research I saw, I read some papers, I won't, unfortunately, I won't be able to remember the name right now, that says that denial really works well. Even though you say that, you know, denial really works well, I think it was some retrospective or something, I don't remember right now, but I mean, they, they say denial was an effective strategy. So um, it's, I guess I don't have like a concrete question, it's just lots of thinking how, how the response and this, the, this extreme morality and especially the fact that people don't want to believe it is really playing together in this case. Yeah, and I, I think what you're talking about that you, you will have true believers, particularly in politics, but you can also have true believers among your customers. And there are some customers who actually will be unfazed by it. That's why I'm saying that like, you're seeing a large segment might have this moral outrage because they see infamy, but there's another segment that's going to be like, no, this is okay. This is, this, this is fine. I think I still believe in the company. I believe in, in what it's doing. And they're, they're kind of immune to that, these, these sort of true believers, because there is a dysfunctional component to identification. And it often is a result of over identification when your identity becomes so caught up in whether it's a politician or it's an organization, you don't want to believe. And so what that does is that sets the foundation for denial to be effective. And it's, you see this in, in some dynamics, you see it in politics, but you also see it now in some organizations where the organization is involved and there's almost sort of an ideological component to what they do. And that ideological component is what binds that organization to its customers. And um, I'll give you an example. In, in the US, uh, when the candle crisis occurred, and in the US when, oh, what was it like, I think 70 people died. And that all came from one farm in Colorado. That farm had a very passionate following among its customers because part of that farm's appeal was it was both a family farm, but it was also one that prided itself on Christian values. Their strong base never saw anything wrong. And in fact, they even one of their, their supporters argued that it was all a plot by big chemical companies to discredit this farm and to destroy them. And so you can have this ideological component even among some customers that will do it. And that, that's, what's, that's what's happening, this sort of this over-identification and this, this over-reliance that this organization or this politician is your self-identity. So of course you'll believe anything, you'll believe any denial that comes your way. Because you, you want to, you want to deny it. And, um, what you often find is among really high identifying you know, stakeholders, 
it takes more than one crisis before this shakes out. <laughs> they, they need two or three, but the third, second or third, like, ah, yeah, maybe this wasn't what I thought it was, but you know, there, there is that dynamic in play and you're going to have those, those true believers that this, this isn't gonna, they're not going to worry about it. Cause if, if you, they'll just look at it and say, well, this isn't, that isn't that important. We saw that when we were looking at some data back from one of the Amazon crises and when, uh, Bezos came out and took responsibility for it. They're like, well, you didn't, well, that's nice, but you didn't have to do it. We were okay with it. So, yeah, there, there, there is that, there is that dynamic. And there's a, there's a danger when you just play to that level of stakeholder, I think it is an organ, but I have, I have seen organizations do that where they've decided we're just going to go to the high end. I like, I think um, uh, for me, for the crisis management advice, I like to think of the least common denominator. It's kind of go with, assuming they're kind of like low in identification and kind of work from there. But yeah, the high ones are a whole different category for you. And sometimes they don't, they don't like it when you're over accommodative. They don't think you did anything wrong. And it's, it gets crazy. And then yeah, and you throw in politics and it gets, it gets, it gets really warped then. Yeah, so with the response, kind of thing about you still need to be accommodative, you still need to focus on the victims, and you still have to hold yourself accountable. And I, I think accountability is probably the best explanation of it, because even, even though responsibility is at, at the core of, of attribution theory, it's really about an organization being accountable, because you can be accountable without being responsible. And even in a crisis where you have a low level of crisis responsibility, you still want to be accountable. We, we are going to do this. This, this was ours. We're going to take care of this. You know, this was, this was our facility. We are going to make sure everything is, is, is taken care of. It's like, like workplace violence is a good example of that. You still want to be accountable and kind of help out, even though you're usually not held accountable or responsible for it. And the key still though, is you're going to have to state that you know what you did wrong because a generic apology doesn't work when there's moral outrage. People want you to acknowledge why, because if you just apologize, like, well, you, you're just, those are, and I, you know, if you can call it authenticity or whatever you'd like, but it just doesn't ring true from like, well, okay, yeah, you apologize, but I don't know that you know what you did wrong. And that's part of coming back, you know, kind of returning. And some of that gets that, if you want to look at, Another outcome that sometimes is used in crisis is forgiveness. You know, do people forgive the organization or not? And what you find is a, a moral violation. If you, that's going to create questions about, you know, whether or not they'll forgive you and they're going to be less forgiving, but you, your response can kind of move towards that and kind of talk about that here more here. Because in acknowledging the moral violation, though, then it's the key there. Because the outcome is it reduces value and congruency. So when you when you acknowledge the moral violation, that signals to people, oh, you know what the value was, and you're gonna now you can return to that. If I just apologize, that's not very good evidence that you know what was wrong and that you can fix it. Now you know you've identified it. It's like okay, yeah, you understand what's wrong. It also creates perceptions of empathy. That, that you are empathetic towards the victims. And those both serve to move you away from infamy. And empathy is actually one of the foundational elements if you want to try to then to build for forgiveness. I don't think any response will immediately get you forgiveness in these types of crises, because these are bad. You know, this is, these are extreme crises, it's gonna take time. But if you want to move away from infamy and towards forgiveness, then Recognition of your moral violation is a key component towards that. Um, so there's this different type of dynamic going on there. And so the lessons are that, you know, moral outrage is one creator of extreme or sticky crises. And again, there can be more. We, we talked some about, about that as well. You know, some race might be a part of it. You know, children being affected could be a, a part of it or other types of, you know, really vulnerable populations. So if you think back in time, uh, for instance, in the United States during COVID-19, there was a, 
it's been particularly problematic for the African American population. They have been disproportionately affected by COVID-19. And part of that is a long-term distrust in government public health messaging because they know that th there was this extreme violation of their rights with the, with the syphilis studies done in Tuskegee, where they knowingly let African American people with syphilis continue to have syphilis to the point you know, where they became, you know, where it created the, the mental problems and resulted in death instead of treating them just to see what would happen with the progression of the disease. I and mean, it's, it's one of the reasons why in the US we have institutional review boards for research nowadays. But that was a moral outrage that resonated throughout the African community to this day. And they still don't, there's still, there's this distrust built in and there's been some people writing about that now. You revise your responses to recognize moral violations because there's this different dynamic going on now. And so now I've got to deal with that moral violation. If you don't, if you deal with the moral violation, you can see some benefits, not your typical benefits for your outcomes, you know, but you're going to see some benefits in terms of value, congruence, and empathy. And that's why we need to kind of reconsider the outcome measures. And then we move towards value, congruence, empathy, and then maybe, you know, again, not immediate, but long-term with forgiveness as possible outcomes to look at. I think what these outcomes share in common is the outcomes are always determined by the stakeholders. You know, the stakeholders purchase intention. They decide if they're going to buy or not. You know, they decide if you're infamous or not. They decide whether or not to give forgiveness. And so even though we look at these outcomes as, oh, these are beneficial to the organization, they are all bestowed upon the organization by the stakeholders. So they're all on, on their grounds. Even stock prices to a degree are, are with the stakeholders there. And research can create unintended consequences. And this one came up. I, I hadn't thought about this one, but uh, I was talking about this up in, with a group up in Canada. And they said, okay, what if an organization purposely creates a scan just to boost their profits? Because we know they can exploit, they can use greed. Because they know, hey, I've got this way out. I have a way to fix this. <laughs> All right. So I can, I can then fix this. And then they could realize a potential net gains from the actions. Um, yeah, I guess that could happen. And it's like, wow, you'd hate, a, you'd hate to think a company is that evil. And that, <laughs> but <laughs> I would not put it past them. And I hope that's not how someone takes the research. But yeah, I don't know. I, I'm hoping that, that that's not <laughs> that doesn't become that would not become a trend. But uh, again, but I think from what I've seen from some what? Yeah, no, I just want to say that I think this tactic is also quite might be quite popular for some uh, artists and you know like celebrity uh, mm -hmm. business uh, show business. Um, they might do some moral violation to stand out for someone who believes in them. You know, to actually mm -hmm. capture the audience and and differentiate between uh, someone who hates them, I guess, okay, they'll hate me anyways, and someone who really loves them. I feel like it's really also similar to, my gosh, uh, first model of public relations press agentry. Uh, uh, yeah. It's kind of very similar in, in, in the sense, this idea. Yeah, I think, you, I think you're right. I, I think like celebrities, you know, uh, whether they're actors, actresses, or musicians, this might be a route to take because we have kind of seen, whether intentionally or unintentionally, they've, they've, they've taken that route anyway, that infamy can actually be good. It's when they talk, um, some bands, the, the best example of that was the Rolling Stones, were built on negative publicity. The more publicity, even if it was negative, didn't matter to them. It still, and it was reinforcing for their fans and sort of their, their, their uh, the the image they were trying to cultivate as the bad boys of, of rock and roll. So yeah, I think I think you're right. I hadn't thought about it, but yeah, this would this would be a this would be a model for a lot of celebrities because it is it is kind of a press agency model and it's publicity at any cost because you know that in the end it, it won't be that bad. Uh, a good example of that if, if you kind of look back retrospectively, there was an analysis done with image restoration theory on uh, when Hugh Grant got caught with a prostitute. And how that actually was a benefit to his career. So you're seeing some kind of stuff going on there. Yeah. Sometimes it is.
it can work, yeah. I was just going to say, um, thank you for this. This is really fascinating research. Um, it seems to me that examples of the Rolling Stones, they were actually challenging moral values and that was the expectation that we had of them. And so yeah. we sort of see this and, and, you know, we actually, it becomes less about moral outrage, but we actually kind of have a reverence for, for people that are changing how we think about things and how we, how we feel about things. With, with the Stones, that was absolutely our expectation that they would challenge. Mm -hmm challenge these kind of um, uh, moral norms that we have. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think that that's that's important thing because when it's counterculture, yeah, how, how that can work. Yeah, the Stones are a fascinating group. They're still a great band to see live, you know, if, if we ever get to see live bands again. But they're pretty good. Which, uh, Raises the, do you know what a black swan is? What, something when something's a black swan. It's actually the origins of the concept actually comes from Australia. A black swan is yeah. Uh, is it a rare and unusual event? Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. Uh, originally Europeans believed all swans were white until they started kind of going out in the world and like oh. There's a black swan. <laughs> and, it's like, and so it stunned them, yeah. So it's rare and un unusual. So it gets a lot of attention. And we've seen that in crisis communication to a degree, that we get fascinated by these black swans. Uh, Fukushima is a good example of that. Are we likely to ever see a Fukushima event again? Probably not. I mean, are we going to have a case where you know, there is a, a tsunami hitting a nuclear reactor just in that way? Uh, again, probably it's rare. So uh, a, a problem you can have there is that it, if we focus on these black swans, maybe that's not the best way to go because I'll, I'll see these ones and they'll be like these really odd events and they'll say, what can we learn from this? I'm like, no, you better make this a generic lesson because if it's specific to the black swan, um, how am I going to use it? And too often, it isn't a general lesson, it's a specific lesson to that event. And it's like, well, I don't think I'm going to be in that event again, but there are lots of these other events I might be in. And so the, the, the question we were worried about was, was whether or not are there these crises that, that trigger moral outrage or not. And so for that, we kind of went to the practice. You know, what, there's, a, there's a lot of very interesting research being done by practitioners, these groups putting out white papers that oftentimes gets overlooked and as if it's not good research when it's oftentimes excellent research and they have some really good sources they talk about. And this is a table from the Institute for Crisis Management and each year they keep track of media coverage of crises. And the ones in yellow here would all count and fall into the category of ones that would create moral outrage. And if you look at that, that is a hefty chunk of the crises that receive media coverage. This is not saying that they're the most common crises that exist, but they're the most, the most commonly covered crises in the media. So again, so I, I don't want to claim that, oh, in, in the realm of crises, scances, or not scances and management misconduct occur more than any other type of crisis. In terms of media coverage, that is the case because you start looking at that because you, you got discrimination, just 2018 was the last full data set they had. So you got 14% there, management misconduct, 22%, you're already up to 36%. So you add in sexual harassment, you know, you're up over 45%, you add in white collar climb, 50%. So you, you can account for probably 50% of the crises out there that draw media attention are ones that would create moral outrage. So for us, that was good evidence that, okay, this is not a black swan. This is actually something that you're likely to encounter. Uh, scansus is a little rare, but you can think examples of scansus that do occur. And management misconduct uh, is frightfully common. And in fact, they started doing this in the 1990s. And since then, I think every year, management misconduct has been their number one category for frequency within the media. So this is, this is a problem organizations are likely to have to deal with, in part because it's, it's really hard to prevent management misconduct. 
because there are people and people do bad things. Even people that you think are good when you hire them do bad things and get into management misconduct. Uh, these results. Dr. Coombs, may I ask, as, as you were thinking about this, I was just thinking one, if I'm not mistaken, I've read it somewhere, please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, one of the issues with uh, managing Katrina was that, you know, once the catastrophe happened and, um, um, you know, people needed help, a lot of the media turned their attention into, you know, looting and, you know, all, all, all this kind of thing. So, so they turned their attention to this moral outrage rather than turning their attention to actually helping people. Yes. So, again, I'm not sure if I can formulate the question very well, but I guess, you know, what are the consequences of this sexy, as you said, that's a very good word, of the of of you know of, of the of, of this crisis and, and can we really help anyhow with this yeah that's that's a, a common problem because with with media coverage in these events when when they start extending over a long period of time the media start looking for new angles on the story and they go with ones that can actually then generate you know interest among a potential audience and that that's what that what we're seeing and that's been a common complaint of, about disaster coverage is that when it turns time to trying to help people and talking about here is what we're doing to rebuild and here these sorts of things they tune those stories out because they, um, the people aren't interested in that and they turn to the ones that, that are more um sort of salacious for people and will attract them and, and that's a continuing struggle that that you have in crises is that they might turn uh, and when the crisis has been going on for a long period of time. And that's when you have to rely upon your own, your own use, probably turning more towards your controlled social media to try and get your frames out and to get your messages out. But that's, that, that can happen when things go, when it extends for a long period of time. Yeah, I, would, uh, would we say in this case, moral crisis, because I mean, the idea of the moral crisis, more people would pay attention, more people would talk about mm -hmm. this, more people would, uh, would be interested in this, more people would be outraged about this. But in, mm -hmm. in when, when the moral crisis is mixed up with other crises, uh, where, you know, I know people are affected and maybe mm -hmm. a disaster, maybe, maybe a human error, I don't know, it can actually lower the attraction in the sense that, okay, we're not paying attention to the right thing. We don't, I don't want to hear about this. There are more important things happening. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe even COVID is a good example because everyone is worried about COVID right now and things that are happening on the moral side, not as, as interesting one. I don't know, just a comment. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that's just, um, the longer a crisis runs, the more likely you are to, have, to, to run into different issues. And actually kind of the, the last thing that we kind of talk about kind of gets, gets to that when you talk about uh, Clement and Gabby Annetta was because they were looking at the moral, they were looking at the framing, how the media frames a story. And what happens is, and, and this comes out of Entman's work on political scandals is the media plays a big role in this. And when I use the term media, I want it to encompass both traditional media and social media, because nowadays it's, it's a mix of the two. It's, it, it's you know, it, there's not a good reason to separate them out because they're, they're both going on. Because they talk about this more general category, this organizational wrongdoing. Again, they view it as socially constructed. And organizational wrongdoing, there's a the technical definition. It's when participants do something, but some outside social control agent says that's wrong and you should be punished for it. And the Palmer initially talks about the state, but the media can be a control agent and punish them. Customers can be a control agent and punish them. Even activist groups can act in that way. And, and what they did is they looked at, uh, they looked at our friends at Volkswagen. You kind of, this idea of social construction is important because it gets it framing and how the media frames it. And, and it brings us back to choose in a crisis because frames help us identify what type of crisis we're in. And as an organization, if I start seeing 
all right, this looks like they're talking a lot about injustice and ooh, yeah, there's this exploitation appearing in, in the discussion. I've got to start thinking now that I'm going to get some moral outrage here. Yeah, not everyone, but I, I might need to be prepared and address that in my, in my responses. Because what they looked is, is they looked at in the scandal that the media is fundamental to, to knowledge and the perception of the organizational wrongdoing. And in fact, Edman argues if the media doesn't cover a scandal, there's no scandal. He, he uses that in his definition. There's got to be media coverage to it. And in fact, that's part of what drives infamy, is infamy needs coverage. Again, whether it's traditional or social media, the, people have to be talking about it because if no one talks about it, it doesn't really matter apparently. Now, it does because some people are still going to be hurt and wronged, but it's not going to get the widespread attention. These other ones do. So it makes people aware of it and the frames influences the perceptions of it. And so this is the question, does organizational wrongdoing matter if there is no media attention? Yeah. On one level it, it doesn't, but on another one it does. You know, there, there was still wrongdoing even if it didn't get a lot of coverage. You know? And that's the thing about it, you know, organizations the media, again, broadly speaking, can hold organizations as part of their accountability. And if the media ignores an event, they, they can let organizations slide. And what we found here is Volkswagen, the media and their other stakeholders didn't let them slide. Because Volkswagen, this, their response, do you remember the emission scandal? Very cleverly, you would hook a Volkswagen up to a, a, a machine to measure emissions and the emissions would change magically. And when you unplugged it, it would go back to being much more polluting as a car. Volkswagen blamed that on a couple of rogue engineers. And so we're supposed to believe large multinational corporation over a course of a number of years just a couple of engineers managed to slip this software in. Nobody else knew about this. No one was concerned about it. No, no, one, no one had any inkling this was going on. Yeah, so people are like, well, hey, this is a nice story, but it's a fairy tale, right? The media is not buying it. Customers aren't buying it. Governments aren't buying it. And so uh, eventually, you know, more research is done, they reacted badly. And then you get these headlines, Volkswagen chiefs hushed up emission cheating. It's like, okay, yeah, people did know. And that's when, uh, that's when people started to get fired and they started to kind of root people out. And that was a case of the framing and how the media framed it. The media attention and the media framing forced Volkswagen to eventually confront its management misconduct. Is, you know, they're talking about, oh, it's a couple of rogue engineers. So maybe uh, there's some intentionality there, but you know, it's not that bad. It's, you know, the people at the top, we didn't know. It's like, no, this was widespread. You knew that this was a, that this was a problem. And this is, this is problematic. And again, it shows the power of the frames because the frames help to identify the cues for us. And that's why when your crisis managers really kind of need to know what crisis they're managing. You can't manage the crisis you hope to have. You got to manage the crisis you really have. And I've been doing work with a firm that's, that's based in India and they're using a lot, they're using um, cues through AI analysis of media coverage where an organization can very rapidly find out what frame is appearing and how that might affect their reaction to the crisis. And I mean, it's, you can do it on your own, but the AI will get you there faster. And actually, it becomes fairly accurate. And so this was just from the idea that, you know, yeah, that the media is an important social control agent. And again, if we use it more broadly, but social media, that can be individuals who are pushing that and bringing it forward for an organization as well. And again, just kind of what I've been talking about a little bit here is that managers have to be aware of how an issue is how it's being framed. Now, you can try to correct any errors if there's factual mistakes being made, but it's difficult for an organization to combat a, a viable frame. So if there's fundamentally no 
factual errors in that frame, you're going to have to kind of live with the way it's being framed for you. Because you might say, oh, we're not that bad. You know, look at the things they're saying about us. Well, if that's what they're saying about you, that's what people are going to think about you. You need to address those. And stakeholders had the final say on the crisis. Again, you got to manage the right crisis. So you, you, like I said, sometimes managers say, this is the crisis I would like to manage. Well, that's great, but this is really the one you, you have to manage in those situations for them. So I thought I would you know, end up with, with the Volkswagen case because it's, it's a nice illustration of how uh, it, it's hard to fight the frames that exist out there on the crisis. And if you're framed into this management misconduct, you got to treat it that way. You can't play it off as like, oh yeah, a couple of engineers did the wrong thing. We got rid of them. The world's a great, good place. No, in that case, it's management misconduct and they needed to specifically address that they knew this is what we did wrong and here's what we're doing to prevent it in the future. Blaming a few rogue engineers doesn't get you there. Uh, that's not optimal and that's not going to help you with value incongruence at all and volkswagen great global brand there was no doubt they were going to recover from this never any doubt the problem is it took them a lot longer to recover than it should have at the same time they're doing this general motors has a problem with their ignition switch and the ignition switch actually does kill uh, in the end, it was under 100 customers. They're driving their cars, the ignition switch cuts off, the engine goes off, they're in accidents. In some models, the airbags then didn't deploy because they were tied into electronics, so people died. They recovered faster and had a better reputation more quickly than did Volkswagen. And Volkswagen did not kill anyone. Now, they didn't do wonders for the planet, but they, in terms of severity, if you were just to say, um, kind of cheated emissions, killed some people, you think uh, killing people's worse, it's more severe. But it was in recognizing in how they responded to that, that GM held itself accountable, identified exactly what it did wrong and how it wouldn't do that again. And Volkswagen was very slow to get to that. It's, it's, you know, if, if you were to start with the case saying, here are the two scenarios, which one is going to be harder to deal with? You would think, ah, oh, it's got to be GM. This is going to take them longer to recover. Yet Volkswagen, uh, through their suboptimal response, created problems for themselves. So it goes back to that beginning and the notion that, yeah, there are optimal strategies which you can benefit from, and there are suboptimal ones that, that can harm you. But both even very good, well run companies can be seduced into going in the wrong direction. Yeah, but Volkswagen though, if they had admitted responsibility, of course, then would have been opening themselves up to massive fines and all sorts of other things. So they dodged that by pretending they didn't know anything about it. Whereas in the case of uh, GM, you know, they, they knew there were gonna be liability and there were gonna be lawsuits from the accidents, but by taking responsibility, they actually could diffuse it. Yeah, and I think that's, the, the problem that Volkswagen did is Volkswagen tried to act like it wasn't a systemic problem. And, and it was. And, and they, needed, they needed to get at the systemic aspect of it. And that's, that's one of the things we're looking to explore in the future is this idea of individuals, a full group, and a systemic action for it. So, yeah, Volkswagen just managed to keep things alive for a lot longer than they needed to. If, if, they, had moved, if they had moved quicker and... Um, and trying to kind of clean up and realign upper management from the start, I think it would have gone better for them than the, than Dan was a couple of engineers. I'm just curious if we also may talk here about uh, the compounding effects of other crises, because we can treat climate crisis as a as a crisis in itself, just uh, you know maybe of a different definition. So, so in that case. Volkswagen kind of amplified with its response and with its crisis amplified. Um, no, no, Volkswagen crisis was amplified by the climate crisis, mm -hmm. and yeah. um, and here it was it, it was a different story. No, that's that's a good point because what's happening is 
that the people who bought those cars, their customers bought them because they wanted to be less polluting, because they cared about the climate crisis. And that made it worse. And, and I don't know that Volkswagen ever recognized that, that that's why people were so mad. Because you know, they're like saying, well, your car still works. You know, um, but they're like, well, no, I bought this car specifically because I care about this and I want to prevent, you know, I, I don't want to add to it. And here you are. I, and I now, I, I, don't, I don't think they understood how deeply that hurt their customers in, in those regards. And climate crisis is, is an interesting one because that's now um, creeping up very fast to one of the top two or three global risks that managers recognize. And so that's going to that's going to drive a, a lot of, of corporate communications going forward because that has risen very quickly up the risk levels and what you find is what companies define as the greatest risks tend to then start to dominate a lot of, of, of their discourse later on. So that's, I mean, it's um, a number of, of studies over the last two years have really shown the rise of, of that as, as, a, as a risk that organizations need to manage. And that would actually be part of, that would actually factor into your crisis communication planning. Uh, the way not that you would necessarily have a crisis, a climate crisis directly related, but the risks related to that could be, people could question that. I mean, that's a case where people might start questioning, well, are you doing enough? What are you doing? And so an organization needs to be ready to address those in the future. Yeah. I found the ideas around the framing of the crisis really helpful um, for under, uh, and, and the idea that a scandal is, um, is constructed really, really useful. And I, do, I wonder if there's a degree to which how accessible the narrative is um, affects the degree of the crisis. Like, I think one of the differences between Volkswagen and, and GM is that the story is really simple with Volkswagen. They cheated admission mm -hmm. to tests, whereas the stuff with the GM switch and the fact they knew and, and I feel like that story is a lot more complicated and a lot more nuanced. Yeah, um, if, and if you read the internal documents from GM, it is really complicated because GM, GM didn't act not because they didn't want to, but they didn't know who should act. They spent all their time trying to figure out which department should do it. Because like, yeah, this is a problem. I think you should do it. And they're like, I'm not sure that's me. I think it might be them. And they wasted all this time internally, you know, because they, they said, yeah, this is bad, but who should fix it? It's very strange. Yeah. Some will come out more, some will be clearer. And I think one of the, the things that, that complicates crises is when you, you don't have a clear frame, when there are multiple competing frames that, uh, uh, that exist without there. If you look at it from France and Johansson's kind of multi-vocal approach, there could be multiple competing frames out there at times. And those are going to be the more complex crises. And those are the ones where that, that's when uh, you, you probably really need to hire a con consulting firm <laughs> for, you know, is, uh, there's a lot of, a lot of crises are fairly basic and organizations should be able to handle themselves, but others become much more complicated. And yeah, if, if the frame isn't good and it's, it's not clear, it, it could be this, it could be that, you know, it's going to, it's going to take you longer and you've got to figure out, well, what, what do I do until I, I can get clarity on all of this? And that's part of why organizations create holding statements to kind of get them, give them time to get to, to that clarity. But yeah, there, that's, that would be one of the complicating factors. Do you want to talk about a sticky crisis? That would be one where it, it's, is it, is it really the management? Was it, was it something external? We're, we're not quite clear. Because yeah, there, there are times and again, it's hard to give percentages on, but there are times when you just don't really know what's going on. It's like something happened, something bad happened, and we're not really sure who's, whose fault this is. Uh, other times you kind of know, and you know quick, and that's the beauty of stealing thunder. If you use it correctly, you bring it up. Wells Fargo knew before the story broke what they did. They had identified it. And they didn't do anything. And then the LA Times broke the story. 
on them. And, and so if that was the case, Wells Fargo could have stole Thunder if they chose to, because they, they, they had identified the problem themselves internally, but, but they didn't. Uh, another, and so in that case, you know when this comes out, you know what the frame is going to be <laughs> if you're Wells Fargo, because <laughs> you, you already know what the outcome is, but other times it's, it's just not. It's, you know, particularly early on with, in, when you think about industrial accidents, there could be a lot of things that caused them. You're, you're not sure, it, it could have been human error, it could have been some, you know, was it just some kind of atmospheric condition? Uh, was it management misconduct? Was it neglect? We don't, you know, we don't know, yeah. I worked in the PR department of a sports team for a number of years, and those crises are, are <laughs> quite specific. Uh, but one of the things we always had trouble with was that the players wouldn't necessarily come clean entirely. So you'd be trying to mop up after them, and then more and more would come out, and we just didn't know. Yeah, that would that would be very hard because yeah, they they don't want to tell you everything. Again, they're like like. If I don't tell them, they're never really going to know this. And yeah, and then you get you get some just really, you get some really bizarre ones. Yeah, I. The sports crises are so unique because they are are so driven oftentimes by athletes' misbehavior. Um, my favorite during COVID was where uh, Kyle Walker, who plays for Manchester City, got caught um, having escorts come to his house for a party during lockdown <laughs> and it wasn't the fact that he had hired escorts but the fact that he had violated lockdown and the team was not happy <laughs> he had violated lockdown protocol and this was now very public knowledge because of course all the papers wanted to cover that one you know as opposed to some guy who uh, two players who were out in the park from opposing teams who were practicing together and again violating lockdown much much more interest in Kyle Walker situations. <laughs> I was trying to think of a kind of company or brand that had come back from infamy. And because, um, I mean, we talked about Enron and James Hardy and things like that. And I was thinking maybe like Nike or Nike. Um, like it's one that my students always bring up when we talk about corporate social responsibility. But realistically, these days, they weren't even born when a lot of these labor exploitation <laughs> things happened. Um, and they always say, you know, you know, half of them will be wearing Nikes as well. So um, it didn't necessarily affect their purchase intentions, but they're very aware of the infamy of the time, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that that is a good example because, you know, Nike was, became sort of the, the face of sweatshops and abusive labor practices in the garment industry because they, they were the leader. And, you know, when, you, when you're trying to expose a problem, you go after the leader. Yeah, and then, so they have had to come back from that. You know, I, I think another company that kind of bordered on infamy that's made quite a good comeback, and again, it relates to social responsibility, is Unilever. Uh, Unilever had some, there were some very serious doubts over a decade ago about Unilever and social responsibility, and they made a real commitment internally trying to fix that. Um, and there's a, another interesting case, I think if you want to talk about sort of recovering from infamy, is Shell Oil. Shell had a series of problems in the 90s. Um, they had the Brett's Bar oil buoy, and they also had the situation in Nigeria where they may or may not have known about the government's um, sort of... Uh, murdering of local people to give them access to certain oil fields that were there. And when this all happened, Shell, which Shell actually had prided itself on being really a good, pub, good in terms of public relations. It had some really good campaigns previously. And so they actually did some real soul searching. It's like, wow, we really messed up here. We did not see any of this coming. We didn't see, we didn't see oil buoy coming. We didn't see Nigeria coming. And they, they did a very bold move at the time. They put up on their website, and this was prior to social media, and said, okay, we've got this discussion forum. Tell us what you think about us. And people did, and it was not pleasant. 
they did not like them. And in fact, they, the only requirement they said is, is please don't use, you, you know, vulgar language. Well, that did it. And they let it, they let it stand. And they used that as a way to begin engaging their stakeholders and realizing we, we got to understand better how they feel about us and we need to work on that. And they took that messaging and they did try to then change themselves based upon what they were hearing from their stakeholders. And so I think that was a company that had, was sliding clearly towards infamy, particularly, I mean, when you get associated with, you know, graves, you know, hiding mass murders in graves and to then just say, okay, yeah, we've, we, we've got to listen to them. What, what are we doing wrong? What do we need? What should we be doing in the future? And they used that as a springboard to come back and kind of restructure a lot of what they were doing in terms of their corporate communication. They, they made those hard to find. There was, um, there was a, too. Well, they, they had that really prominent on their site in the beginning, and then it sort of started sinking back and sinking yeah. back and sinking back. So it got really difficult to find. I mean, it might still be there. I don't know. No, they, they, they did away with it. Um, I have, and it's somewhere in a box up here, I've got a hard copy of almost all the comments that were made during a certain time period for it, because yeah, they, they eventually did kind of get rid of it once they had learned, and then they, they moved other forms of engagement. So it, it, changed, it changed them and really made them, and I, I don't know if, they, if they're drifting away from this again or not, but they, there was a piece written about how they, how they address this and this idea of moving towards engaging their stakeholders, like we just lost touch you know, it's like, clearly, we, we do not know what you all are thinking. And, and, and they, they realized they were out of touch and needed to get back in touch. That was a way to do it. Um, I, guess, I guess Exxon might be an infamous one, but then they just never cared. Yeah, Mitchell. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, teams. It was a uh, team. It was really great to hear from you. I've been teaching your work for many years, so it was uh, wonderful to, to to hear from you firsthand and to get to meet you here. Uh, I had a question. Um, I, my background's in sociology, and uh, when I was sort of hearing you speak, and previously when I was reading your study, um, it seemed like this triadic appraisal conceptualization of uh, scances. Uh, mirrors some of the old uh, models of deviance from structural sociology in the mid 20th century, right? From a transgression of social norms at the level of an initial crisis mm -hmm. to higher level forms of deviance when you violate a criminal code. And I wonder to what extent that mirrors this concept of scancer. So, so where does the criminal code and criminality come into this? in terms of a higher order scandal, right? And what does that then in turn, if we take sort of ideas regarding, you know, structural strain theory and, and uh, you know, what does that sort of like from Robert Merton, what does that have to say about practitioner motivations in responding either ethically or unethically to that? Um, yeah. have, have you considered the, at least the trans, like the, the criminal factor in, in regards to this? Yeah, that, that's been in the background and one of the sort of related disciplines, um, although it, it sort of then became organizational wrongdoing, is they, they would call it organizational deviance. And so some of that research, I think, probably traces back to what, what you're talking about, kind of had some of the sources in there trying to understand organizational deviance. But I think, I don't know if they thought that might be too strong of a term. <laughs> you, know, you, you don't want to be the deviant organization for that. But yeah, the, there seems to be, I would say, both with management misconduct and with scances, they tend to also be probably criminal violations, but they don't have to be criminal violations. Uh, Myland, in in the cases looked at, Myland of the three, Myland was not Myland was not a, a criminal violation. It was purely moral. Um, so you, it's hard because most times when when you're when you're that badge it probably has crossed some regulatory or legal line but there are times when you, you know myelin proves you can you can do it without hitting that that legal milestone so yeah i, I would i would probably say the vast majority of them do involve some kind of of legal violation and if you i think if you would look like at the media coverage of what the the institute for crisis management found under management misconduct you probably kind of, I, I would guess maybe 100% of those are somehow linked to some sort of uh, criminal violation that they have there. I think you probably have to work really hard to get that level without criminal violation. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> but, but you can do it. I, I think you know, Milan showed, hey, we can just be blatantly greedy and put people's lives at risk and not really violate any laws. And, and that's where, you know, the, the social construction comes in. That's when, you know, the other stakeholders, whether they be online or they be the traditional media reporting it, that's when they bring it out and they air it. I think Dorian has a question. I'm not sure if you can see everybody's window there, Tim. All right. Yeah. Hi, Hi. I'm from Indonesia. So I've been there um, a few times. Yeah. Well, we met in Washington, but sharp time. Yeah. Well, I have a question about how significant culture uh, play, play roles in this uh, crisis because for multinational corporations, when they settle outside of their country, usually the uh, culture of the uh, country where they settle down is, uh, you know, like really, really influence the uh, management to make a decision in this uh, uh, crisis. And the second one is um, about this crisis usually attack not only the company, but it's also attack the reputation of the uh, manager itself, mm -hmm. management, and of course the company. So because of that, usually the manager won't, uh, won't get the uh, another job easily after, after they have a crisis. Because in Indonesia, we have a Lapindo Mat, if you recall that. Lapindo Mat is a um, mining company that, that um, cause the mud from the earth come up and then uh, cover all over the city and not finished until now. And the owner of the company itself uh, ruined his reputation. So what do you think about it? Thank you. Yeah, um, the first part, culture is, is very important in this because it, it's socially constructed with scandal and it brings in that moral component. And that's going to vary by culture. In fact, the, the last theme uh, for, for the previous Scandology conference was all about the effect of culture on scandals. So, okay, this behavior in this culture is a scandal. This culture, it's not. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, if you're a multinational corporation, you're doing, you're going along, you're doing your business in this particular country, and then your behavior gets reported out in another country. Like, oh, that's wrong. That that's 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 inappropriate. That 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 scandals what you're doing. Like, well, no, here this is all perfectly acceptable. And so if you're a multinational, you're going to have to think about balancing those out. And so what, mm -hmm. what then guides, what becomes your guiding moral principles for you? And, you know, companies hit this all the time in terms of social responsibility. You know, do I use a higher standard than is acceptable within this country because I have these stakeholders in other lands? So, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a real problem. We start talking about scandal because scandal being socially constructed is very much driven by the culture in which it, which it exists. Not only nationally, but even within particular industries, certain behaviors may not be viewed as scandalous that are viewed as scandalous in other industries. So, because you can have to talk about industry culture. So, so that's, that's a real, a real challenging component for managers to start thinking about for that. In, in terms of the managers and the effect upon managers, it depends upon the industries. I think some industries, you know, if you are held responsible for some of these sorts of crimes, you will be stigmatized and you won't and you won't find work again. It'll be very difficult for you. Other industries, not so much. Um, I'll give it in, like in the sports industry in the United States, it's not uncommon for a coach to be involved in a scandal and then in two years get another job. But that's maybe kind of unique to that industry. Where other industries that could be held, it, it depends if, if the industry holds that against you or not. If you are a rising star and you're, you're moving up in an organization, yeah, a scandal might just, just end your career completely. You would hope that people wouldn't uh, hire people again versus trying to get a second chance. Could be very could be very difficult for, for most industries, I would say. Because you don't see too many... 
managers in high profile crises suddenly pop back up again in top leadership roles, what they usually do is they wind up becoming consultants. So they move to more of an advising and work with a consulting firm to, to provide advice. Because they still might have useful information, but you don't want them to be the face of your company. It's like, okay, yeah, um, you can consult with us, but I, I don't want to see you, you know, as part of my brand. So, yeah, so it's depend on how strong is the brand or the company is. Because uh, if not, then people will will think like identically, you know, uh, the 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 manager is the company. Mm -hmm. uh, usually, yeah, in Indonesia, that, yeah. a lot of startup like that. And when when the owner make a mistake and become viral in social media, and then that's uh, identical with the company, people perception, actually. Do you think so? Yeah, yeah. Um, when you start talking about what we often call celebrity CEOs, where they and the organization become one, mm -hmm. then, that, then that becomes challenging because the organization reflects on them and they reflect on the organization. Yes. You know, and there, there aren't a lot of those types of CEOs. Because, you know, we're, we're always mm -hmm. the, you know, I, I see a lot of practitioners talking about, oh, the, you know, the CEO is the face. And I'll say, yeah, they are, particularly in the investment community. But when you're talking about the larger range of stakeholders, oftentimes people don't even know who a CEO of a firm is. Mm -hmm. But the ones who are and get closely associated with the firm, that creates a whole different set of risks and crisis concerns for them. Because then if it's your celebrity CEO and he or she has a crisis, that is definitely your crisis as opposed to saying well that they're having some personal issues and you know you remove them and that might help to solve the problem but if they are your organization and you remove them then who are you there's there's a yeah. lot of questions with that yeah yeah so there's yeah. there's rewards but there are risks when you just kind of fuse your ceo and the organization together and they become one just like this book, Mark Zuckerberg and Cambridge Analytic, actually. Thank you very much. Oh. Yeah. Sorry, team. I, 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 I'm aware that it's probably getting late where you are, and you and you want to get to bed. Um, <laughs> just just one final final question, and I put it in the in, in the chat. Um, I, I was just your, your point on culture just raised this idea that uh, I want to do you know individualistic and hi highly uh, pluralized societies with um, different media systems. Does that, does that then modify the public's interpretation of scandal over time? Um, my little boy is just running to. Back in the video there, sorry about that. Um, so uh, what I'm trying to say there, in, in sort of my knowledge of America and, 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 and the media system continuously exposing those things, does the public become apathetic about these scandals over time? And does that lead to a lessening of, of moral outrage? Yes, yes. Yeah, that's, um, that's what Entman's data shows in politics and political scandals, is that the more scandals you have, the ones towards the end have, have less impact. And people are just like, uh, I've kind of used up my moral outrage. You know? so, I, so if if you're in an industry where there's a series of problems, if yours is the last one that's revealed, it's actually going to be easier on you than the one who had to be first in line. They're going to take the they're going to take the brunt of it. I suppose in the U.S. we had you know around the time of Enron, there were a number of other companies that ran into some pretty serious problems. Same thing. Uh, managers cooking books, managers taking monies. You had Adelphi and Tyco and a handful of other ones. Well, as each new one came about, it's like, oh, that's just another one. Yeah, they, they do that, don't they? Those companies, they, they, that's how they are. And yeah, so yeah, you do see, a, I think you see a lessening of the moral outrage. For them. We, just can't, we just can't keep that outrage going all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank Tim for being here today and uh, 
everyone for attending. And as I've, you know, I've posted already, I'll post a video of this so that you can watch it again and uh, pick more up from it. And actually, I think it'd be good for classes, like a pre-lecture discussion to have people watch it. So anyway, Tim, anything else? Anything you want to add or? Uh, no, I, I appreciated all the questions that really adds to it, uh, hearing from all of you and, and the questions you raised. You, you bring up some points that, you know, I didn't get a chance to cover that really should be talked about. So you brought up some really interesting points. Yeah. And so the discussion, no, I, I enjoyed it. And it's just like, um, I, I just kind of the last notes, we, we know a lot about crisis communication, but there's still a lot we need to learn, particularly when we start getting outside of the comfort zone and the boundaries of what we can currently explain and those are some really fascinating areas to explore so uh, because a lot of people think oh is there's there's still things to understand in crisis yes there's still, there's still a lot we need to know out there okay i'm going to hit Thank the stop you. button and wrap it up and everybody have a nice day or a nice Thank night you. wherever you are hi yeah. everyone thank bye. you yeah have a good thank day you. stop recording